get going. It is one o'clock. And I'm so happy that so many of you have been able to join us today. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? Looks like yes, okay. Welcome to this informational session on the American Dream Literacy Initiative Grant Opportunity, which deadlines uh, December 14th, 2018. We are so grateful to our funder, the Dollar General Literacy Foundation, without whom none of this would be possible, as well as to our partners in uh, the American Library Association's Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services, and the Public Library Association's Project Outcome. So I'm uh, Mary Davis Fournier, I'm the Deputy Director of the ALA's Public Programs Office, and today I'll be joined by my co-presenters and experienced American Dream Literacy Initiative Project Directors, Christina Davis, who is the Innovation and Sustainability Librarian at Danbury Public Library in Danbury, Connecticut, and Mary Sager, Assistant Manager of the Chandler Public Library in Chandler, Arizona. Over the course of the next uh, hour, we're going to talk about this $10,000 grant opportunity to support adult literacy. Uh, we'll share some ex past experiences, challenges, and best practices, and go over the requirements uh, and cover some best practices for competitive proposals as well. But first, I'm going to reiterate a... Um, a some technical and housekeeping matters before we begin reiterate uh, the things that Samantha Oakley was um, talking about as many of you were logging on, just for those of you who are joining us right now. So in our virtual classroom, um, only our presenters have microphone access, but you're welcome to type any questions that you have in the chat box. Um, to send a chat message, just move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on chat. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A window to communicate with uh, public programs office staff. To send a message through the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Q&A. Please don't put technical questions in the chat window as uh, they could be missed because that window flows fast very quickly. We will respond to the technical questions via the Q&A um, as quickly as possible. And uh, please note that this session will be recorded. So if you'd like to review any information, you may do so via the archive version that we send out later today. So I think I saw a question zooming by about can we get a copy of the slides? Yes, you'll have access to the whole webinar um, after the today. And we will have time for questions at the end of the presentations. So I just want to provide a little bit of context uh, for this initiative for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, ALA's history with Dollar General goes back to the beginning of this project 10 years ago. Over the past 10 years, um, we've had a fantastic impact um, stewarded by libraries. Uh, there have been six rounds of grants dispersed between 2008 and 2018. There have been, over that time period, 214 grants that have been um, made to urban, suburban, and rural public libraries in more than 33 states. Over 188 libraries have participated in this. And over that time, more than $1.5 million has been distributed to libraries. Um, our Colleagues in the Office for Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services recently completed a retrospective evaluation of the initiative, and some of their findings have informed this year's uh, grant opportunity and are relevant to the proposals you'll you are contemplating going forward. And um, so I'd like to just highlight a few of those findings briefly as well. So um, this study affirmed that the essential role that libraries play as centers of community for English language learners. And the study also categorized the top six reasons 
that English language learners access the library. Um, in order, based on that research, they are employment uh, to support children in schools, children they have in school. Language acquisition, computer and internet usage, uh, education, and then also pathways to citizenship. So I'd just like to pause for a moment um, and understand whether those findings resonate with your experiences at your library with this type of service. So please feel free to just chime in for a minute in the chat box. Yeah, and we are 105 strong in this webinar right now. So I know there'll be a lot of input. Yes, so we're saying, right, connection to computers. Yes, that all resonates. Mm -hmm. Computer use is higher, so that would be up on the list. Mm -hmm. Conventional English programs. Right, so Hispanic communities has apprehension about accessing the library. Mm -hmm. Language and education, education. Yeah, employment aspects, right. So I should say that these were aggregated findings over the years of this initiative. So the data pool was recipients of these funds. So um, is representative of the experiences of American Dream uh, Literacy Initiative libraries, but I think um, not necessarily um, overall nationally, but it sounds like each of these sort of priorities listed um, are encountered to various degrees of frequency among all your communities. And I love that some of you have sort of also added the, the challenges that you are experiencing um, with this usage. And I think that um, Mary and Christina and their experiences will speak a bit to that as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just to say the purpose of this $10,000 grant is to help public libraries and Dollar General communities add or expand literacy services for adult English language learners and or adults in need of basic education and workforce development. So that is the purpose this grant is grounded in and I, it's, it's broad. Right, so this year, under this current round of grants, we'll be able to award 16 $10,000 grants to develop collections and foster services for adult learners and or expand existing programs to add services or to foster community partnerships. So I'd like to stress the words develop, expand, and add. So this grant is appropriate for libraries getting going with this work expanding the scope of adult literacy work or and or adding new aspects of service to your work. And I will go over just a bit in terms of eligibility as well. So eligibility for this grant, there are three general criteria. One is, one is um, and this is easy to verify, you must be located, your library must be located within 20 minutes of a Dollar General store, distribution center, or corporate office. It's easy to verify this. Um, you need only go to the Dollar General website. I think Samantha will be able to post that link in chat soon. You enter your library zip code and see whether you fall within their um, boundaries, 20, 20 miles within. Uh, the boundaries of their store, distribution center, or corporate office. Um, public library, you need to be uh, applying on behalf of a public library. Uh, the library needs to demonstrate, and we'll talk a little bit more about what you need to demonstrate in the proposal, but demonstrate need and capacity to provide literacy services for adult English language learners. So a very broad um, capacity there. And then this is a side note, really this third criteria applies to previous grantees. If you were a round six grantee, you may apply again. Um, you may receive two consecutive years of funding, but 
that is the limit of consecutive years of funding. If you are a grantee from one of the many past rounds, you are of course welcome to apply and will be essentially viewed as a new applicant. Um, I would stress that you should speak a bit about your previous experiences with this grant and um, discuss that in your proposal and how an additional sort of grant will help bolster your efforts. And then I want to just touch base on the grant terms as well. So if you apply, here is what your library is committing to. We require you to spend the money. Um, part of the proposal is a budget, and you'll have to sketch that out. We will require you to utilize uh, PLA's project outcome participant evaluations. I'll say more about that in just a moment. We will uh, require that you complete all required reporting uh, that includes evaluation and project reporting, that you develop a sustainability plan. You'll talk about sustainability in your proposal, but the idea is that you have access to these funds and they are um, unique to this budget and this grant and that you will use them for sustainability purposes that you'll share your experiences and promote your work. So that you will um, share what you are doing because if you are being recognized with this type of grant, we believe that, you, which is a, quite a competitive grant, we believe that you are uh, planning to doing and planning to do something truly stellar. So we would like you to share the good work that you're doing. And we'd like you to spread that word locally and in your region, uh, professionally and publicly. And then, of course, that you abide by funder acknowledgement, which is detailed under the terms of the grant um, in all that you do. And I guess I'd like to ask, um, well, I was thinking I would ask how many folks are familiar and using Project Outcome already. I'm not sure if there's a way for hands up in this particular web platform. Um, but I can say that uh, Recently, um, during the past round, use of the project outcome platform was uh, piloted and it proved to be um, a worthwhile, provide worthwhile tools for participant evaluation. And this year, all American Dream grant recipient libraries will be required to use project outcome to track participant feedback in their programs. It will be a requirement of the grant. Um, after the grant is awarded, there will be a webinar taking grantees through use of the customized American Dream Literacy Initiative surveys, which will be available in Spanish and other languages serve, served by uh, grantee libraries. Um, it is a great resource that I know um, our co my co-presenters can attest to uh, today. and. Um, will support its use throughout the, the time of the grant. So then before I turn it over, just want to um, highlight some important deadlines. Of course, the application deadline is December 14th. You have um, until then at just about midnight Eastern time to get your proposal in. Um, at the end of the, the webinar, we will put up contact information for any additional questions you have following today's webinar. We will be notifying uh, grant recipients by January 7th, probably on January 7th. There will be an orientation webinar February 6th. It is mandatory. Um, please, if you're planning to apply, put that in your calendar right now. Um, the pro there are other webinars that will be available as we go along, including the one I mentioned on the um, on project outcome. The programming period for this grant, so in other words, you receive your award notification, you receive your funds, the time you have to do the funds, you, the programming that you propose, the activities you propose, the collections acquisition you propose, um, is between February 2019 and November 2019. And then I've also listed the reporting deadlines. So as you plan your proposal and the activities you are proposing, please keep these dates in mind and frame your work around these dates to be fully compliant. Okay. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over 
to um, Mary Sagar from the Chandler Public Library in Chandler, Arizona, where it is always sunny. And I believe uh, she told me even uh, during the winter holidays, it is 60 degrees, which in Chicago, I'm already starting to envy. She's going to share a bit uh, about her community and what the adult ELL needs have been and how Chandler has leveraged their American Dream funding to respond to them. And I'm just gonna um, mute myself and uh, remind Mary to say next slide, please, so that I can advance your slides. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about how the Chandler Public Library was able to utilize this grant. And um, I'll be showing some slides. You can go ahead and advance the next one. Um, I'll be showing some slides um, on this presentation. And all of the individuals that you'll be seeing um, are actually students who participated in our adult language learning classes. Um, they were part of an exhibit of photographs at our Chandler Center for the Arts. It was called 1,000 Voices. So everyone that you see um, is either a graduate or a current participant in our program. So um, the population of Chandler is over 258,000. We're a growing community. We are a high-tech community which borders Phoenix. Our average household income is over $75,000, but we do have about 9% um, of our community living below the poverty line. Chandler is a, a very diverse community. Approximately 23% of the community speak a language other than English at home. Although many of our residents are Spanish speakers, there are a growing number of newer residents in our community who speak various languages from Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe. Nearly 15% of Chandler's population is foreign born. Um, due to those numbers, we do see a strong need for English language learning in our community. We do have a, a history of supporting these educational needs of our adult learners by improving their conversational speaking, listening, reading, writing, um, and other skills. We support giving them the skills that will not only prepare them to reach their personal and professional goals, but will also help each individual develop confidence in themselves and engage with the larger community, which is very important to us. We offer adult education classes in small group English language learning, talk time, and citizenship preparation. All of our classes are taught by highly trained volunteers and organized by our literacy coordinator, who is a certified educational administrator and has years of teaching experience and working with um, English language learners. Last year, 37 volunteers provided classes for 694 adults at all four Chandler Public Library locations. And our adult learners came from 46 different countries. Next slide, please. So our small group English language learning classes meet twice per week for two hours per session. Classes are kept at a five to one student teacher ratio. These classes require registration and assessment by the literacy coordinator. Each applicant is assessed on their English literacy level and they are assigned to either a beginning or intermediate class. Currently, we're running 13 classes with 67 attendees. There are 150 applicants on the waiting list. So this is a very popular class. Next slide, please. Talk time is a conversation practice class and requires no registration. These are very full classes. Um, lots of our, our large numbers are a result of attendance at talk time. Each session features a practical theme such as going to the supermarket. Learners can attend as many sessions as they like. We often recommend that students begin to attend talk time in preparation for small group English language learning since there's such a waiting list for small group. We're currently offering seven talk time sessions, which are held in the mornings, afternoons, evenings, and weekends at all four of our library branches. Next slide, please. We also offer citizenship classes, which meet in 10-week sessions and help prepare the students for success when taking the citizenship exam. Currently, there are two citizenship classes being offered with a total of five per year. Um, other resources include um, 
online programs such as lynda.com that you're seeing. Many librarian, maybe many libraries offer these, um, Mango, Rocket Languages, and PowerSpeak. We also provide in our main library a learning lab and a job center, um, which are open to all library users and are staffed by trained volunteers as well. Next slide, please. So the, the goals of the grant, um, before we received this grant, the curriculum materials that we had been using were um, published in the early 2000s. So with the grant funds, we're able to purchase new updated textbooks. We used the side-by-side -side curriculum by Malinsky and Bliss, and the newest editions are absolutely fantastic. Um, they include support in life skills, career and academic readiness, and expanded reading and writing materials that weren't offered in the previous editions. We purchased the Side-by-Side -side Plus Level 1, 35 copies, Level 2, 35 copies, um, workbooks and teacher guides, 20 each. We also purchased the Foundations student books, 15 copies, and teacher guides, three, for learners who had minimal background in English. And these new curriculum books, um, not only were they paper books, but they also provided an online e-text version of the textbook, which is allowing the tutors to engage the students in the use of technology as it pertains to language learning. Our tutors have now set up computer lab sessions with their students to use the e-text as part of the language instruction. The publisher of Side by Side, Pearson, Pearson Publishers, they were able to send one of their trainers to Arizona to instruct the tutors on the new curriculum. She stayed for the entire day and it, it was fantastic because she was able to help the tutors transition from the old curriculum to the new. Um, in addition to updating the curriculum, we're able to purchase supplemental materials such as US and world maps, dictionaries, picture vocabulary cards, and iPads. The five iPads are being used to demonstrate the use of the online learning opportunities that the library offers, um, as well as the text version of the, the workbook. Uh, we were also able to, um, I was able to go to um, ALA this year, um, not as part of the grant, but just because I was able to go. Um, we sent several of our other staff members to go, and we did receive some training on project outcome which is, is huge for us. Um, we think that that will be a huge help to us going forward. Next slide, please. So challenges. Um, our biggest challenge is actually meeting the demand for our services. Um, we have tremendous demand in our community for English language learning, especially since they, they are free at our library. We would like to be able to expand our programming to meet the needs of our community. Our small group English language learning classes have an average wait time of three months, and people do cycle out, but um, it is a long time to wait. Um, slots do become available regularly. But to meet this need, we're continually recruiting new volunteers since it's all volunteer driven. We have a Friends of the Library group that helps recruit volunteers, and also we have partnerships in the community. Um, the Chandler non Nonprofit Coalition. Also, there's an organization called For Our City um, that organizes different not-for-profits to come together. And there are major employers in our community who provide volunteers, such as Intel Corporation. Our volunteer coordinator also uses the online resource Volunteer Match to attract more volunteers. We hope to add several more small group classes next year. I'm hoping to reach a total of 20 classes being offered at any one time. Next slide, please. So sustainability, um, we do have a program that, that has been ongoing and it has been recognized for our ability to attract students. Um, if anyone is looking for any advice on how to do that, how to attract students to the program, we're certainly willing to help out with that because we were very successful in that area. Um, and we are able to recruit and train volunteers, which is an important component of, of what we do. We do have our friends group that they provide yearly financial support. The library, of course, provides the meeting space, the use of IT services, and the skills of a volunteer coordinator and our literacy coordinator. And now with the use of project outcome, we have support for the evaluation and the improvement of our services using these customized um, surveys, which are actually going on 
um, this week and next week we're, we'll be doing some more surveys. And so um, going forward in the future, we're, we're looking at some different options to expand in addition to just providing more classes. We're thinking about the potential of providing hotspots so our students might be able to check those out to provide internet services at their home to follow up on their classroom learning. Potentially adding smart TVs in our tutor rooms to use those online resources. Um, headphones for the computer lab, since sessions are now scheduled there, adding some more iPads so students can work um, independently. And we're looking forward to many more years of expanding our programs and providing these services to the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for that great overview. Um, and I guess I want to, before I um, turn it over to Christina, I just want to highlight to those of you who are listening um, some of the things that were so important to the way that Chandler thought about their programming um, and proposed it. Um, there are, they had very clearly defined goals for this grant and for this money. Um, they were very frank and transparent about the challenges in front of them. Um, and the reason that the timing was so important for this, these funds to replenish and update their content. Um, and she spoke about partnerships and the effective way she's using partnerships to um, recruit volunteers, to be in touch with the community she's serving. Um, one of the things that the retrospective evaluation of this entire initiative um, really brought out was how critical partnerships are to successful projects. I'm sure many of you are experiencing that in the work you're doing already, but I really wanted to call it out. So. Thank you so much, Mary, um, okay. for work well done. And I will ask you, Mary, to mute your mic. And um, then I want to uh, ask Christina if you, I believe your mic is on. So that's good. So I want to, um, of course, welcome Christina Davis, the Innovation and Sustainability Librarian uh, from the Danbury Public Library in Danbury, Connecticut. She's also graciously agreed to share her library's experience with um, this initiative and also speak uh, some in some specific ways about how they've used the project outcome. Uh, findings. Thank you. I will mute myself and just tell me when to flip the slides. Will do. Well, thanks again, Mary. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to speak with you all and share what we've been doing here at the Danbury Library as part of the American Dream Library um, Literacy Initiative. Um, go to the next slide, please. To give you some background on Danbury, Connecticut, we're a mid-sized city of 85,000 residents with a bustling downtown district, which hopefully you don't hear in the background, um, and a sprawling suburb. We're one of the most diverse cities in Connecticut. Over 30% of the population is comprised of new immigrants from countries including Ecuador, Portugal, Brazil, Peru, and India, among others. And 45% of our residents report in the last census that they speak a language other than English at home. Next slide. In our school districts, there are 43 languages spoken, different languages spoken. The most common languages spoken in Danbury other than English are Portuguese and Spanish, and our schools have bilingual programs in both. Next slide. Our library is located in the heart of downtown, and our program attendance and use of statistics reflect the evolving needs of our community. We have seen attendance at our talk time programs grow over the years. In 2017, we had a total of 600 attendees at the weekly conversation group where participants practice speaking English. Usage of our digital language services has also been on the rise. New accounts are created almost daily for Ellis, which is a computer program designed to provide individualized instruction to achieve English fluency. And our newest service, Pronunciator, has seen a spike in access for the English language learning component. Pronunciator also offers language learning for 81 different languages, but English is the most commonly used. So in addition to numbers, we also listen to our patrons. The question our information services staff heard most often was not if we provided English language classes, but when they were going to be offered. So the expectation was set by our community and we knew we needed to do something to help the growing need. 
However, before jumping into providing instructor-led classes at the library, we wanted to do an assessment of classes already being offered in the Danbury area. Duplication of efforts is always something we want to be aware of, and finding ways to collaborate and expand rather than replicate is almost always the most impactful and efficient way to go. So in our assessment, we found that there were a few different English language classes being offered. Some were from for-profit schools where tuition um, became a barrier to a lot of potential students. The local community college offered classes, but they were at a more advanced level um, and did not fulfill the need for the basic instructor level classes where we saw a lot of the need being. Western Connecticut Regional Adult and Continuing Education, which I'm going to refer to as We Grace from here on out, um, also offered English language classes at all levels and for free. Um, however, they were and are at max capacity with over 100 students on their waiting list at any given time. They also require identification for their classes, which um, not everyone was comfortable um, approaching. So after speaking with WeRace and other community organizations, we felt that the library could bridge the gap by providing basic level courses for free without requiring identification and erasing any financial barriers by providing the textbooks at no charge to students. Um, next slide, please. Um, to successfully pull off a new program like this, you need a great team both in the library and outside the library. Um, our communications specialist, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Fuenzalita, has been instrumental in the entire process. We're so lucky to have his knowledge of the community and experience um, teaching English language classes to help truly make this program a success. Branching outside of the library walls, we partnered with the following organizations to help bring these classes to the library. The Tribuna um, is a bi-weekly newspaper published in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, and is distributed throughout public buildings and businesses throughout the greater Danbury area. The Tribuna offered free advertising for our classes, um, and the relationship has continued to grow. They also offer free advertising for our computer classes in Spanish, as well as our English um, our other classes that we have offered throughout the library. Um, we also partnered with WeRace um, to provide instructors for our classes. WeRace already had an established um, and ready network of TESOL educators, so through a subcontract agreement with the city of Danbury and WeRace, uh, we were able to use grant funds to pay for um, instructors. We were also able to share CASA's um, testing resources and also enrollment information so we could use their waiting list and vice versa. So that way no students were um, left out of the classes. And finally, we also partnered with our literacy volunteers on the green. Um, literacy volunteers have been using the library space for many years. They meet in our meeting rooms um, and tutor students. So we wanted to have them included as well and ask their input for updating our collection and if there are any resources that we could um, also use to help their efforts. Next slide. So with the funds granted by the American Dream Literacy Initiative, we were able to provide three 50-hour English language classes, uh, basic, uh, level one and level two. We allocated the majority of the funds to pay for the 150 hours of instruction, and we also purchased um, textbooks, workbooks, and teacher editions of the Cambridge Venture series. We chose this series because, because it is the same textbook evaluated and used by WeRace and would allow students in the library classes to move seamlessly to other classes offered throughout the community that were offered by WeRace. Um, so these are the standard offer in Danbury and we wanted to continue with that. Um, an additional um, whiteboard was needed um, when we were unable to um, provide a teacher for the summer and had to double up on classes in the fall, which ended up working um, just fine. Um, and we also were able to purchase new headphones, which were much needed for our language lab. We also purchased um, resources for the literacy volunteers, and those are also available for patron checkout. So next slide. So here are just some of our class um, classes in action. Next slide. So to assess English language proficiency, we're using CASAS along with um, working with Rebase to help, help do that. Um, but to measure the effectiveness of the overall program, we are using Public Library Association's project outcome, which Mary talked about a little bit earlier. 
So our project outcome uses surveys to demonstrate the value of library programs and services to internal and external stakeholders. The surveys that they provide are easily customizable and easy to share with participants both in email and electronic and paper form. They even translate the surveys into Spanish, which was um, very helpful for us and save some time. So with information from these surveys, we can make more informed decisions regarding future programs, including decisions on hours, class size, setup, and, and other things. So next slide. Another great feature of Project Outcome is one is a tool that allows you to generate uh, a beautiful report that you can share with the library board, your city council, your community collaborators, to show the good the library is doing and help build your case for future funding and support. So with, follow, with our follow-up survey data, we've been able to demonstrate that our classes have directly helped Danbury residents find and improve their employment prospects, become more involved with their children's schooling, and make use of community resources that they would not have otherwise been able to. Uh, one student who came to our first class, not speaking English at all, is now on her second round interview for a job with our city. Um, another student um, expressed that they are now able to better communicate with their child's teachers. Another is going on to pursue nursing courses. And one response, which I found incredibly meaningful, was that through the courses, um, a student was able to gain their independence. Um, so these are things that can't be measured through enrollment or attendance or um, even English proficiency levels, but they're very impactful and show the value of, of what we're able to accomplish. So, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Unmuting myself. Oh my goodness. Um, thank you so much, especially for sharing those outcomes, um, which is part of the um, as if you go back to the goals of this grant, it's really what you are both doing, Christina and Mary, and so many of the American Dream Literary Initiative, literacy initiative libraries are doing, are really achieving incredibly meaningful, life-changing outcomes like that. Um, so one of the, I guess, just um, a couple of the things I wanted to comment on that you, as participants in this webinar probably discerned was that the the range of eligible expenses for the funds available through this grant so um, both of these libraries you know paid staff instructor time staff time for materials for hardware and software for refreshments in some cases for transportation when transportation to these sessions was an issue for their um, communities in need um, for professional development so it's a the eligible expenses for this grant are um, very broad and I think have been structured that way to recognize the broad range of needs uh, for libraries to create sustainable resources in this service area. So um, before we go, uh, we will have time for some questions, but before we go to questions, I'm just gonna go through a couple of other very basic pieces of information for this grant opportunity. So to apply for this grant, um, I believe uh, this URL has already been shared in uh, chat as well, but you need to log in and or create a login if you have not applied in the past uh, to the apply.ala.org grants, uh, grants application platform. All applications must be completed online. If you have applied through this platform in the past, you simply need to log in again to access all your past applications as well as uh, this current opportunity. If you have not applied in the past, then making a, a new login is very straightforward and pretty much as simple as making a login on any platform these days. Um, you need to fully complete the online application form, which will require you to provide information about your library, the project, project budget, justification, the entire and detailed guidelines for this grant opportunity are also at that link. You can download those guidelines as a PDF and you can download um, the 
grant application as a PDF in case you, like me, are one who likes to see every all the information you will need to supply in advance of doing an online form. Um, you will be asked to upload two or more letters of support from community partners, uh, attesting to your efforts and also um, to the level of partnership that they are involved in or have been involved in, in the past with your adult um, English learner efforts in your community. Um, they can be new partners who are very excited about taking on this work with you. They do not need to be long established partners, but what we are looking for is really to, um, you know, hear from your community as well um, as ab about the great work that you're doing so that we understand the context. Okay, so I'm always asked sort of what, how grants are selected um, and what the review criteria is. And first I would like to say that all of these grant proposals are peer reviewed. Um, and that means that the uh, applications, your proposals are being reviewed by your peers, by other practitioners who are providing these services and this type of work to their communities. They are being asked to read your proposals. Every proposal is read by at least two reviewers and then rated along a numbered scale. But they are being asked to do that with these following criteria based on the following criteria. That is your um, articulation of need for these grant funds, uh, the quality and vision a vision or ideas that are underlying the program services or collection enhancement plans you're articulating. Your library's capacity to do the work being proposed. The evidence of ability to reach your targeted participants. So the uh, specific community in need in your, in your uh, service area. Um, evidence of a post-grant sustainability plan. Now that does not mean that you have to include a um, neatly tied with a bow sustainability plan for your work, but it does need, it does mean that you need to be able to say, this is why we need these funds, this is why we're asking for them, and this is how this relates to our plan to continue to offer these services in the future. So just um, the beginning essentially of your sustainability plan. If you have one that has already been worked out, feel free to include it. But we are hoping that these funds are also a spring forward, springboard to solidifying that sustainability. And evidence of relevant existing or potential partnerships, and this again ties to our, uh, our finding that this work is best done in with the support of excellent partners. And then, of course, the clarity and completeness of your proposal. Um, proposals need to be well organized, responding to the questions that are asked uh, completely, and um, proposals that you feel your peers would be able to read. Okay, and then I'll just go quickly through a few uh, characteristics of competitive proposals, um, what we found in the past. I did see that there was a question that zoomed past that was about uh, the level of competitiveness of this grant proposal. And we'll speak to that in a moment in Q&A, but I, I can say that it is quite competitive. So what we suggest you do for your proposal to be competitive is to, of course, follow the application guidelines and deadlines to the letter, um, to answer all questions thoroughly, to clearly state your institutional and community goals for this work, to feel free to articulate your aspirations and outcomes, uh, the outcomes that you are hoping for, um, to that speaks to sort of the level of excitement and engagement um, in this work that you and your library have and that peer reviewers are looking for because they're reviewing these and reading all these proposals because they are also passionate about this work. That you provide context for your work. So give us a sense of your community and um, you know what the population in need represents, what your library's history of this is, 
um, service is and what your aspirations are. Discuss challenges, opportunities, and barriers to success that you may have experienced that this grant will make a difference to addressing. And um, relate a plan for the future. Again, that means that you don't have to have it all worked out in terms of sustainability, but reviewers want to see evidence that you are thinking in those terms. This isn't, you know, one year of $10,000 drop in the bucket funding. This is related to a longer trajectory of work that you are leading at your library. And with that, I think, I think that is um, all the information that we've prepared to present, and we can now transition to questions and answers. Um, I would ask that, um, and I'm going to leave this slide up um, while we're doing Q&A, because um, we are hoping that if you don't have a question answered here, or if you feel your question is very specific to your community, that you will um, email us about it. And if you have specific questions uh, for Christina and Mary, feel free to reach out to them. They've been so generous as to offer to um, provide advice and sort of um, peer mentorship in this grant for others. And now that I'm looking at it, these fantastic um, program participants are very dynamic and making me a little dizzy. So let's go to let's go to Q and A. Um, please post your questions in the chat, and we will be able to respond to them. And uh, Christina and Mary, feel free to unmute um, because some of these may go to you as well. Um, I can answer two right off the the bat. Um, does the size of your community impact, uh, the size of your community impact chances for the award? So I can say this, um, and this also speaks to another question I think that was like, how many people applied last year? Um, so last year we received 85 applications and um, this year I assume we'll probably receive more. We only have 16 grants to give out. Um, I wish we had 85 to get, give out. Um, and so therefore it is quite competitive. The, uh, once our process is once we are finished with the peer review process, then um, we take all of the most highly rated uh, proposals and go through them. And it is, uh, we try to have representation among um, large, mid-size and small communities. Um, that may, and we try to have as wide uh, national distribution as possible within the constraints of the Dollar General uh, community 20-mile um, radius requirement. So the true impact of your community size um, would be a very down in terms of a level of consideration. Um, I really feel that in the past few years, we have the absolutely the driver for the funding has been for making these grants has been the quality of the proposal articulation of need and sort of potential to work with these funds to um, sustain and build so i hope that answers your question i'm looking at these um, and i'm going to read them out loud as well okay um, Give me one or two outcome measurements that could be vague versus uh, strong. I would like to ask Mary and Christine and or Christina to uh, respond to that before I weigh in as they've just sort of well, I, I mean, in terms of outcome, I know what we do with our students is we do um, a pre and post test. So um, if we're looking at evaluating a new curriculum, which was basically our project, we would look to see um, if there's any improvement um, in, the, uh, in the English language skills of, um, of our students as they take the, um, the, the exit exam, basically the exit assessment. So we're hoping to see some improvement in that because right now if people 
um, if they don't do well, then they would repeat the second level class again. We would give them another opportunity to do that, but we would like them to be able to um, be able to acquire those skills pretty rapidly and move on to the next phase. So we're hoping when we do um, when we look at outcomes, we see that people will be um, a little more confident and a little more able to um, to use their new skills. Christina, did you have anything to add? Um, no, I agree with Mary. I think um, you can measure student retention rates throughout the program, um, the progress, as Mary mentioned, and you know, pursuit of advanced classes or advancement in their careers. Okay. Samantha, I know you've been tracking these questions and I wanna make sure I don't lose any and that they're, um, we capture them all. Can I ask you to lob them at us? Of course. Um, so a couple of people asked if this grant is only a bit limited to ESL adults. Uh, absolutely not is the answer. ELL, so English language learners. So there uh, can be um, ABE, ELL, ESL. Um, there is more what we've been seeing, I think, and what you saw in Christina and Mary's uh, presentations is that many libraries have been using these funds to support uh, a range of programs and services. Some of them have been um, support for employment. Some of them have been cultural literacy along with English language learning. Um, there certainly are just um, basic literacy uh, services in low literacy areas that are not necessarily um, uh, ESL um, communities being served. So it's, it's pretty broad. For, for more specifics, definitely go through the guidelines that are posted on the site. Great. Um, the next question is, can it be a university library that, that applies if it is open to the public? Sadly, no. Uh, the, the, one of the criteria is that this is a public library opportunity. What I would suggest if you are as a university library partnering, if you are currently partnering with your public library, um, that you work collaboratively on a proposal. Um, but unfortunately at this point, it the funding restriction is to public libraries. Okay, uh, the next question is, can a non-awardee participate and look at the data, tools, et cetera? Can a non-awardee participate and look at the data and tools? So are, I'm assuming you're referring to the project outcome um, tools for participant evaluation. And um, so project outcome is a platform that is open to participation, um, free and open to all public libraries, and actually I believe they're opening an academic library uh, platform for it in the next few months as well. Um, those tools are accessible. Um, the data that is uh, gathered is goes straight to the library itself. Um, there are a lot of resources, and maybe we can post the project outcome site link. So there are a lot of resources to being trained on using that platform. Um, it provides a dashboard for your library and the data that comes in through all of, through that platform is being aggregated by PLA on a broad national level. So that data is being pushed out in terms of national trends um, and then the only other thing to add to that, in case this is what you were talking about, um, is that the retrospective study for the American Dream Literacy Initiative, that uh, report is available um, on the ALA website under on the initiative page, and that is free and downloadable as well. Great. Uh, the next question is, if a church within our community has a population that also comes from outside the community but is looking to us for opportunities, will that affect our chances? I'm assuming they're asking if they partner with the church. Is that okay? Um, Right. So, of course, all of that is fine. It is you are the library is applying, so it is 
to you to articulate the need you are seeing and how you plan to serve that need. Um, I don't know of many libraries that are restricting access to these services based on um, zip code or geographic location uh, generally, so this would apply. So this is to up to you. If this is a partnership you want to take on in a population that you see need in and want to serve through the library, then include it, of course. Another question is, if we do not get the grant, um, can we get feedback on how we can improve our proposal for future grants? Absolutely. What a great question. Yes, you absolutely can. We will, uh, you will receive uh, a notice of either funding or that you were not selected. And with both, we're able to provide um, both your peer review comments and I or one of my colleagues in the ALA Public Programs Office will be happy to talk you through uh, your proposal and um, anything you could do to strengthen it in the future. We will also tell you if, you know, I, to answer sort of the earlier question, sometimes not community size, but geography um, has intensity of number of proposals for certain areas has to do with selection. So if we received 80 proposals from Illinois, um, we probably would not be making a proportionately high number of grants to libraries in Illinois. Um, so we will be very transparent about that. Our hope uh, at ALA with any of the grants that we are offering is that applying for them is um, a, a um, also a can be a professional development opportunity as well. And part of our mission in the public programs office is to help foster um, practitioner skills in being able to leverage the funding and support they need. So absolutely. We will do that. Great. Uh, next question is, are there any guidelines on budget allocations? Is it okay if a large percent initially goes towards professional staff if we've recently purchased materials? No, there are no, um, there are no guidelines on that at all. There are no restrictions. I mean, um, you definitely will need to spend down those funds during the term of the grant. So if you're budgeting professional staff, um, my only caution is, you know, you're operating on a budget year that is beyond the terms of the grant generally, that you make sure that those funds are expended during the, the um, February to November window. Um, and then again, your entire, um, the case you need to make is why that is a strategic move how it will also foster sustainability in future budgets and um, of course point out that you've you've got this taken care of in terms of materials and are looking to bolster this other piece up in terms of staffing to best uh, deploy the materials. Great. Another question is um, so this person works at a large public library system. Uh, should they apply from a certain branch or the library system as a whole? Um, that is, again, a question on your end to determine. Um, and it depends on where you're deploying these resources. Uh, the, the fiduciary agent for the grant will likely, I assume, be the system. So you would likely be, be applying on behalf of the system, but you will, in your proposal, probably be articulating the plan deployment in that branch service area, um, unless your system is configured in a different way. Great. Um, uh, and I realize we're running up on time here, so I'm, happy to, before I answer more questions, and I'm happy to stay a bit over and continue to answer, I do not want to be remiss in um, thanking Mary and Christina for their excellent uh, presentations and being willing to be ambassadors for this grant program. And I want to reiterate the deadline is December 14th. 
and um, you will receive a, a recorded copy of this or link to the recording of this webinar uh, later today. You will also be receiving an evaluation about this webinar, a questionnaire. Please, please, please fill that out. We are a grant funded project and we are incredibly grateful to Dollar General Foundation um, for their support of this project. And with that, I will, um, we can continue to take questions for a little while, I think. Great. Um, so one question is, if um, they're partnering with someone and want to do a program outside of the library, is that okay, like at a community center? Absolutely. Yes, I, it is to your judgment on how your library is best going to serve its community. Great. Um, another question is, if we operate with um, help from other grants, will that affect our ability to apply? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, if it's tied to your sustainability, you may want to make the case for this making the difference, leveraging the other grant funding. Um, you will probably want to provide, that is unusual from what I've seen in these proposals, you will probably want to provide uh, an overall picture of, you know, other grant funds and what that means for your overall budget and your sustainability plan, but no, nope. sounds great. Great. And congratulations, by the way, for leveraging other grant funds. <laughs> uh, do you want a project to be narrow in focus, for example, one to two projects versus five to eight new projects slash services? Um, you know, I wonder, to my mind, I'd say, again, this is up to you, but Mary and Christina, do you have any weigh in on that, on what you feel the best strategies are for that question? I think it depends on what you already have established and going on. Um, I think to start five to eight new programs and services could be overwhelming. Um, it obviously depends on you know, your, the community partners you're working with and your staff internally um, and your capacity to do it. Yeah, I agree. Um, sometimes I think it's it's better maybe to focus on doing less and just doing it really well, um, and then have the potential to expand beyond what you start. But it you know it kind of depends on what your resources are. Agreed. So, but I'd like to add that these questions are fantastic because they are um, speaking to sort of the questions you're asking yourself about the best way forward. And again, all of this sort of goes back to conversations that you're probably having in your, um, or hopefully this grant maybe, if you're not, is an opportunity to have within your library, with your administration and your system, with your community, in terms of the sort of best plan going forward. Great. Um, are there examples of successful programs in libraries for innovative approaches to workforce development that this initiative has funded? That's an interesting question. Um, you know what? There, my quick answer is there must be. Um, we will, we can respond to that and follow up with that um, offline if Samantha can uh, grab your um, contact info. What we would probably be able to do is respond with, um, you know, contact information for project directors. I can say that one of, I thought, and you were, many of you are probably aware of this, that, that one of the sort of innovative um, workforce development slash cultural literacy um, projects that I've seen popping up uh, many places is um, our classes based on cooking, learning to cook, um, you know, using um, food carts and um, engaging community members with um, cooking lessons um, and linking them in some ways to um, a, scaffolding them with other uh, workforce development classes, applying for jobs, basic skills, certifications, um, but anchoring that in something that everyone can relate to and become excited about, which is food. 
<laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so one person is asking, uh, many of our patrons speak English, but not, not receive the education they need and are still looking for language skills. Mm -hmm. Is that Absolutely. an important part of the application? Is that an important part? Yeah, percentage of other language speakers. Um, I would definitely put that in the, in the area of, you know, explaining the context for your request. But all of that is eligible, absolutely. Again, you're making the case for the need and describing it. Great. Mm -hmm. Another um, application specific question, uh, in the adult literacy needs section of the application, should the community demographics be specific to the project or branch library or should it be for the library system as a whole? Right, that's a good question. Um, I would, Those, I can tell you, those were, um, those questions were designed with the, uh, they, unfortunately, they're sort of one size fits all because it's a form. So they were designed with the notion that it be the library community, the community the library serves as a whole. Um, I would encourage you to sort of, um, depending on the size of your community, um, make a judgment there about what will best support your um, proposed scope of work. It will, if, if you're planning on focusing on a specific neighborhood in need, um, I would say that that information will probably be most relevant about that neighborhood in need. But if you have a contrast with the surrounding community, um, then, provide, you know, provide that context as well. It makes your case all the more stronger. And Mary and Christine, if you need to hop off this, um, we understand. <laughs> Feel free. Great. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, so can the uh, financial agent for the grant be a friends group or library foundation? Again, that's entirely up to the library, um, you know, if, if generally your grants go through your friends group or your foundation, then it's absolutely fine. Um, the, the, for the purposes of communicating this in the field though, it will be um, probably communicated uh, in terms of our awardee list as the library itself um, for both our funders goals and our goals. But the, where the check goes is uh, entirely to your preference. Um, if our library already receives funding from Dollar General Literacy Foundation, will that affect our eligibility for this grant? No, it will not. Um, it's good to mention because I think uh, if you end up being selected, Dollar General will probably want to do some, um, you know, sort of cross tracking um, about you know, the sort of various efforts they're supporting, but it in no way will um, sway your proposal um, for or against or weight it in any way. Another question is about the partners. Um, do they have to support financially or can they support by marketing, helping with word of mouth, um, other forms of support? Yeah, it's entirely up to you. I do encourage you to describe that, though, what they're doing. Um, generally speaking, the support I see in these proposals is in-kind support, um, volunteer hours support, marketing support, um, thought partner support, support recruiting uh, participants. Mary and Christina, do you have... Um, of your partners, and you both have very strong partnerships, how do those shake out? Um, one of our partnerships was with the, the City of Chandler Housing Office, mm -hmm. and um, there are many new residents in our community do go through the housing office to, um, to, to try to find a place to live. So they were instrumental um, in helping us reach, you know, reach people to let them know that these services are available at the library. We also work with them on early literacy projects, so it's been a, a long-standing partnership. Um, 
but that's been very helpful working with the kids and with the adults. It's a, a very strong partnership that we've been, um, we've been working with them for quite a while. And um, it's not financial, of course, you know, it's mostly just um, getting out into the community, attending community events with them, putting literature at their different locations, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, um, a couple of more questions. Uh, both of the panelists spoke of ELL success. Uh, can you share a snapshot of a prior grantee that was successful with basic adult literacy? Hmm. Um, I have to tell you that, are you at, this is directed toward ALA, as Christina and Mary have shared theirs, yes? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so I have to tell you, I can't, and it's not because it's not there. It's really because the public programs office just took over this initiative in terms of the management of the grant. However, I can definitely um, direct you to the retrospective evaluation, and I can, again, if Samantha grabs your contact information, I can connect you with um, my excellent colleague, uh, the brilliant Kristen LaHerd in the Office for uh, Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach Services, who has who's, um, managed this grant for the past number of years, and she can put you directly in touch with folks. I'm sorry, it is not familiarity I have yet. And then we have a question specifically about project outcome. Um, mm -hmm. Is there specific questions that the grant will require um, us to ask? And how frequently would we need to survey our students? Right. Mary and Christina, can you provide some insight into how you deployed this? I guess, Christina, you had the slide. Yeah, so you can either do, um, Project Outcome has two different, uh, I guess, tracks, immediate and then follow-up. So we opted um, for this program to do the follow-up to really see you know, how students use the skills they learned in the classes um, afterwards. And Project Outcome gives you different tracks of surveys to use. So for English language learning, it's lifelong learning. And when you go on to their site, you'll see that there are, I forget how many categories, lifelong learning. Um, and then there are a few others. There's even one for summer reading. So one of the questions for lifelong learning that we use for the American Dream Project was as a result of participating in the American Dream 2018, um, program. I use what I learned to complete a task or goal. Yes, no, explain. Um, and then we also added on on questions. So what could the library do to help you continue to learn more? So some are open ended, some are yes, no, and there's always room for explanation. So it's pretty straightforward and pretty sim easy to use. Okay, thank you for explaining that, Christina. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question and then we'll need to sign off. Um, but I encourage everyone to uh, utilize the contact info on this slide and follow up with us. We're really excited about uh, this round and are happy to answer any of your questions. Great. Uh, so this will be the last question then. Does the entirety of the money need to be spent during February through November or can it be used to continue funding instructors for the next year? The entirety needs to be spent. It's a, you know, it's a grant for that period, program period. So the challenge really is how can this sort of window of funding help you? Um, I've seen some libraries do some creative things in terms of the way they're budgeting their year. Um, but yes, it needs to be spent during the, the period of the grant. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much. Oh my gosh, thank you all f for hanging in there during our extended question period. Um, any questions we weren't able to answer, I'm, we're again happy to answer to you, uh, you know, via email or on the phone. Just give us a call, send us a line. Uh, Mary and Christina, thank you so much. Thank you to Dollar General, to Odlos, to PLA, and to my excellent colleague, Samantha Oakley, and also Brian Russell, the man behind the curtain of pu the Public pro Program Square here for their support in making this webinar possible. And thank you all for the tremendous work you do in your communities. Thank you.